Hi everybody, I'm Matt Gifford. I'm one of the organizers of Mobile Portland. Um, how many of you, this is your first Mobile Portland meeting? Cool. cool. Um, so we go through this every time just because there's so many new people. Um, obviously we're about mobile. Um, we meet the fourth Monday of the month. Um, and we're modeled after an sort of international organization called Mobile Mondays, um, although we're not actually affiliated with them. Uh, there's a website, mobileportland.com. Uh, a Google group that is kind of a general discussion group if you have, you know, looking for a position or you need a position filled or you need help on a project, something like that, that's the place to go. There's actually also an announcements uh, mailing list that you can get to or that you can subscribe to on the website and that's just two messages a month just telling you about this meeting twice. Um, we also have a Twitter account at Mobile Portland. And so now, if you have an announcement about an event, or if you're looking for somebody to fill a job, um, raise your hand and I'll come around. There's one rule about this meeting because we record it. Uh, don't say anything unless you have a mic. So. So my name is Kathy, and I work for World Pulse. It's a nonprofit, and we are looking for a web developer. Drupal would be nice. Hey, my name is Ryan Tinker. Um, I'm working on a, I'm a web developer and a contractor. I'm working on a project with a client out of Seattle. It's going through UW's accelerator and they need a technical kind of co-founder to join. Um, I can't design or ever book on them, but um, they are, they should be able to raise, they should be raising money in the next few months, and they should be able to have like an equity slash pay position. So if you're looking for it, it's a, I guess I'll give like a high level overview of the project. And this makes me really nervous. <laughs> um, it is a mobile app for companies to incentivize their employees to Work, work, work out more, either walking or running or anything like that. Um, basically, you, if you're an employee, you run, it calculates the amount of money saved for the organization, and then um, it collects all that money in a big pot, and at the end of the week, everyone who has run or walked or participated in any, any of this stuff gets to um, join in on the raffle, and someone wins a, like 50% of the pot or anything like that. So, anyway, that's a uh, high level overview of it, but if you're interested, let me know. Okay, a little short this month. Okay, so thank you to our sponsor. Um, our sponsor this month is Urban Airship. They obviously supply the, uh, the space. Um, and so that's it. Uh, if you're looking for a job uh, and you're here, they're probably hiring for whatever you do. So, uh, <laughs> um, you know, check out their website. And so this month, um, when, mobile, when responsive web design meets the real world. Um, so this is a really uh, popular topic right now. Some people understand what it means, some people don't. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people don't, but they think they do. And that's really a problem um, because uh, it, it often causes uh, websites to be worse um, than they originally were because you're delivering all this extra code and these wonky weird designs and stuff like that. So, um, to talk about this is Jason Grigsby, he's the uh, co-founder of Cloud4, it's a mobile focused uh, design and development firm here in Portland. Um, he's also the founder of uh, Mobile Portland, and um, so it might be a little bit weird that he's speaking because he's the founder of this. Um, we, uh, we had some other plans for this month um, that unfortunately we couldn't really make it work out. Um, but it also means that we have a whole, whole bunch of stuff for the rest of the year that looks pretty good. Um, but not tonight. But not tonight, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, well, no, but, but, the nice, but the nice thing is he's always given really, really good talks. Um, and this is a... Um, <laughs> Uh, but this is this is a uh, this is a really hot topic right now, um, especially because so many people are doing it wrong. Um, so anyway, he's going to explain why it's important, and how to do it right, and we're going to switch now. So here he is. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to need just a moment to switch. Uh, I'm going to switch to the other side. Okay. Um, so I'm going 
Oh, and I'll fill some space real quick. Um, so, uh, if you have questions on unless Jason, Jason objects, let's we'll try to keep them until after the program. That way, we can get a bite to you really easy. So, it doesn't keep them moving along. <laughs> We're deliberating. We're like, oh, we can totally handle this. <coughs> you are on screen if that helps you now. Oh, excellent. No, I did not realize that. You need to be a secretary rather than so, Okay, that's a that's good screen. I thought, I thought you were saying that I was actually sharing the screen. Is this, uh, there, there we go. Hey, thanks everybody. Uh, it is a little awkward and strange to be speaking here. Um, uh, so it's not a normal thing. So if this is your first time, like we don't normally have meetings and then have people who are organizing the meetings speak. Um, we normally have really, really great guest speakers and I'm going to do my best to be a speaker that's not a guest but that is possibly good. Um, so I've got a lot of material to cover today. So if you want to follow along, I'm going to be tweeting while I talk at Griggs underscore talks, um, and I'm going to the, all the tweets should go out with like the hashtag Global Portland. Um, and the slides are already up. You can get them at Griggs uh, Bitly slash Griggs dash 2013. Well, basically today's date. Um, my normal Twitter handle is at Griggs, um, so you can just follow along there. Uh, how many of you uh, are actually web developers, web designers? Could you raise your hand? Okay, good, because we're going to have some code in this talk. Um, and so, uh, for those who are not, uh, don't worry, it's not going to be too much, uh, but we are going to cover some things um, uh, a little little bit. Uh, don't run out of the room. Those, those slides will go past quickly. All right, so, let's talk about uh, when responsive design meets the real world um, and what that means for us. Uh, I like to think about this as the fact that the web really always has been a bit of a balancing act. And we've got many, many competing interests whenever we're building websites. Um, whether that's things from search engine optimization to um, how do we create good content to what does it mean to build something that's usable. And finding that balance is becoming more and more difficult as we're dealing with more and more devices in the world. Um, responsive web design seemingly offers us a sensible way to deal with the this device diversity, something that solved this problem. And ever since I've been looking at responsive design, I've, I've been asking myself this one question. Uh, and that one question is really, can one size fits all solution, can one size fits all solution really compete with a tailored experience, compete with something that's actually designed for the specific devices? Um, and I think this is an important question to ask from many perspectives. Um, as I mentioned, everything from search engine optimization to context to advertising performance, all of these sorts of areas are... Wow, 
the mic just cut out again, uh, are impacted by search by uh, responsive design. And we have to figure out, you know, what does it mean to use responsive design for these things. I'm going to look at each of these quickly, um, just briefly, like taking a look first at uh, search engine optimization. Um, it wasn't that long ago, actually, that Google had a whole series of things that they had put out for companies to convince them to start doing mobile, go to mobile. Uh, if you went to this site, it was a great example of do as I say and not as I do, because it was a horrible mobile experience. You couldn't actually get to all the content. Um, but, you know, to their credit, they actually said that you should build separate sites. That was their recommendation, um, and that this was the way, this was what they were telling businesses to do. Last year, finally, they changed their recommendation, and now they actually do recommend responsive web design. And they talk about the benefits of it from a search engine optimization perspective. So at least when it comes to search engines, we've got this sort of handled. The next piece is a question of mobile context, and this comes up quite frequently. And people talk about the idea that you build the same things for desktop as you do for mobile, and this being problematic because people on mobile devices inevitably want to do something different. And usually this comes because people believe that somebody on a mobile phone is um, walking down the street with the phone in their hand, and if you don't get the information to them quickly, they're going to run into a pole where they're going to get hit by a car or something of that nature, right? Um, and there are a couple things to say to that. The first is, um, you know, frankly, if they get hit by a car, it's their own damn fault. They shouldn't be looking at their phone while they're crossing the street. And the second is, you know, like you can't design for that. Um, and it's probably not true. Because we know that 80% of people use their phones during miscellaneous downtime, 66% or 76% waiting in line. 88% um, of tablet owners, 86% of smartphone owners use their devices while watching television. Um, very, very common. So common that ESPN calls this co-browsing. 69% um, of people use it for a sale, point of sales research, and that's actually a couple of years old. I assume that it's much, much higher now. People in stores looking up information, trying to find product reviews. And because of this, this idea that we have that mobile context means somebody walking down the road and, and walking quickly and they're going to, you know, they need some different content than what they would get on desktop is, is wrong. It's caused people to say that, that there is no such thing as mobile context. That we can know nothing about mobile context. And that's actually the point at which I think they go too far when they say that we don't know anything about mobile context. Because if anything, we know too much information about mobile context. We know that 39% of people admit to using their phone on the toilet. And when I tweeted this statistic the first time Google came out with it, um, for the rest of the day I got responses that 61% of people were lying. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we're using our phones in these sorts of situations. Uh, we're using phones indoors, we're using them in all these other contexts. Um, and I just, I, I love this photograph. Um, I found this on Google image search one day and I just thought it was totally awesome. And um, what I really like is seeing how long I can leave it on screen before audiences start getting uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, just like, you know. <laughs> it's sad enough. You know what's really funny is I had a slide transition to go to the next slide that was like zooming in on it. And I actually thought it like put it over the top. As if it wasn't over the top enough. Uh, but it was over the top because the next slide actually had a banana on it, and that's just like really wrong. But like advertising, right? Like what are we doing about advertising when it comes to responsible design? Um, and it is another problem. And this is actually an area that I don't think we've fundamentally solved. It, advertising is probably the leading edge of this problem because we've got third-party widgets that we're bringing into responsive designs that are fixed width. We have to figure out how to incorporate them in a way that doesn't break sites. Fortunately, there are a bunch of people working on this. Um, IAB has a responsive design, sort of um, new types of ad units that they're trying to work on that will help us solve this problem. Um, there's a responsive ads um, advertising company, I'm forgetting the name of, that's trying to build an ad network entirely around serving responsive ads. Um, so we are, we are getting pretty close to having solutions for these sorts of things. Um, so take a look at those, um, and in particular, I'd say take a look at what the Boston Globe did with what they call their append around um, uh, uh, JavaScript library that actually inserts ads in different places in the page based on the screen width. Pretty nice. The thing that I end up looking at a lot is performance. Um, it is my toehold when I look at new technologies. It's the thing that I'm most curious about. Um, and it is the thing that I ended up looking at when we went to 
look at responsive design. Um, and the reason why I spend so much time looking at performance is that people really demand fast sites. Like, performance isn't just an optional feature that you can add later. It is, it is core to uh, people's experience. People expect websites to load in two seconds or less. Um, slow sites mean real dollars. Uh, there was a study in the UK that said the number one reason why people abandon shopping carts is because of slow websites. Uh, another study was done, uh, Google and I think it was Bing, both on some of their properties decreased the speed of the site by a few milliseconds. I can't remember exactly, or maybe it was one second they did it. And they saw that that control group used the site much less and it actually continued for two or three weeks later that those users continued to use the site less than they normally would. Um, so we know that this is a big deal. Um, Despite the fact that it's a big deal for e-commerce, 22% of e-commerce sites are actually slower this year than they were last year, which is terrifying. Like, what in the world are we doing? And just because we're using mobile doesn't mean that, mo that our users have different expectations, right? Um, they expect it to be just as fast, if not slightly faster, on their mobile phone than it is on desktop. Um, LTE is not going to save us anytime soon. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do in this space. This is one of the reasons why when I look at things that people could do to make their websites optimized for mobile, um, I think that performance is the number one thing that they should do before they even consider responsive design. And here's why. Most mobile browsers give you plenty of ways to navigate a desktop website, right? We can pinch and zoom, we can double tap, we can do these, all these sorts of things. There are plenty of gestures for that. But there's no gesture that can make a website faster. Right, like they can't sit there and like triple tap. Hey, move faster, triple tap. Right, that doesn't work. Instead, the only gesture you're going to see is a single finger up in the air as they leave your site. <laughs> so back in 2010, um, what I like to call affectionately before the Boston Globe, uh, Ethan wrote his article for List of Park talking about responsive web design. And I got to looking at responsive web design, and not so much what Ethan was saying, but what people were saying in response to the Alyssa Part article, and seeing a lot of things that I found <coughs> pretty terrifying in terms of the performance of responsive web design. And I wrote a blog article called uh, CSS Media Parties Are Fool's Gold. Um, one of those titles that I wish I could take back, but I wrote it. Um, and the main thing that I was looking at was the fact that if you, if you took his AA, Alyssa Part articles, ALA articles, and you took the example that he had in it. This, um, if you haven't seen it, this is the example that he gave in his article. It's a mock website with um, characters from Sherlock Holmes. And of course, because it's responsive, it's got a bunch of different sizes. Um, if you took that, and you simply took the images that he had on that page, and resized them to the size that they would be on an iPhone screen, you would save 80% of the page weight. This was a real problem. And people were, um, people were saying that, hey, it doesn't really matter, this is such a great technique, we, we want to do stuff like this. Um, so when I published the article, I got a lot of feedback that was like, yeah, you're right, we need to do something about this. And the answer is mobile-first responsive web design. I'm like, cool. Mobile-first responsive web design basically just means we're gonna start, we're gonna do progressive enhancement, but we're gonna do it from small screens up to desktop screens. Makes a ton of sense. Um, awesome. We'll put a chapter about it in our book. Like, no big deal. We're writing a book. We'll talk about mobile first responsive web design. Those were the famous last words. Because <laughs> the thing is, is that I went to look around to try to figure out how people were doing mobile first responsive web design. And I looked at 100, over 100 different sites that were in the media queries gallery. Um, and that's, that was the number of sites that were in the gallery at that point in time. Um, and what I found was that for 25% of the sites, the mobile site was actually larger than the desktop site. And I was starting from this question of, of size because I figured that if people were doing a mobile-first responsive web design and they had a small version of the site that was progressively getting bigger, then I would see a notable difference in size between the size of the page that was delivered for mobile phones versus the size of the page that was delivered for desktop. I was only doing this research to try to find the people who were doing mobile-first responsive web design so that I could see how they were doing it. I wasn't actually trying to like point fingers or anything like that. Um, but what, we, what I discovered was something that turns out to be a recurring theme and something really problematic. Guy Pajani, who is 
the CTO for Akamai has repeated uh, that study um, every year since. So uh, he did it in 2012, he did it in 2013. What he found this year was that only 6% of the sites were significantly smaller on mobile screens than they were on desktop. So we can say with some certainty that there's a huge percentage of responsive designs that are actually being done really poorly. Uh, and this, you know, it's interesting just in the abstract, but if we look at specific examples, we'll th see things like Disney.com, where they have a really remarkable responsive design, looks great on a phone, um, but if you actually instrument it, you might find, if you went to Akamai and did their solution, that you know, that's four megs. That takes 14 seconds to download on a mobile screen, on a mobile device, sorry. The way that I think about this is, is much like if you were having a bunch of people over for dinner and you didn't have time to clean your house. So what you do, you just like shoved everything in the closet, right? Like, is your house really clean? No, it's not. Like, all you've done is hide everything. Um, and because of this, a lot of the sites are in fact doing it wrong. So, you know, is it time to write another fool's gold post? Write some, some article eviscerating mobile first response on web design? <laughs> I think Scott Gell actually really got it right when he talks about the idea that being responsive from a layout perspective does not preclude us from being responsive from a performance and interaction perspective. That we can actually build the sorts of sites that are both responsive and responsible. Um, both responsive in the way in which they react to the viewport size and also fast. Um, and I wrote a a follow-up blog post recently calling uh, responsive web design solid gold because if you've got one inflammatory title, you might as well have another. Um, and it's been really fun. I've been arguing with people in the comments. Um, it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> so what I want to talk to you about today are five techniques for responsible responsive web design. And the first one is one that you may have heard before. It's mobile first responsive web design. Right? Like, if people actually did it, it would make a difference. I think part of it comes, part of the reason why people aren't doing it is because there's some confusion between mobile-first design theory and mobile-first responsive design. Uh, mobile-first design theory is the stuff that Luke Rabluski talks about in terms of design, and mobile-first responsive design is his technical implementation. And I'm going to talk a lot about the technical implementation, but before I do, I just want to go on a brief tangent and talk a little bit about mobile-first design theory. Um, there have been a lot of articles written over the last few months talking about how mobile-first strategy is dumb. Um, you know, that people are advocating that uh, mobile only is what you should do, or mobile-first, design everything for smartphones first and big screens as an afterthought. The thing is, is that this has never actually been what Luke talked about, uh, but it's a nice straw man to sort of eviscerate or to attack mobile first design theory. What Luke said was essentially this, which is that mobile has tremendous growth, um, undeniable growth, that there are constraints of those devices, um, you know, whether it's network speed or screen size or any of those sorts of things, that these devices have tremendous capabilities, um, GPS and things that we don't get access to on desktop, or if we do have access to, that they're not as useful as the, um, the capabilities on desktop. And that that growth equals opportunity, that that constraints equals focus, the capabilities equal innovation. For me, I think the main benefit from a design perspective actually comes from constraints equaling focus. Because those constraints are the things that help you focus in on what actually really matters. And it doesn't even have to be simply a situation where you can start over and start from a, um, a mobile design. We had a client who was trying to figure out how to take uh, a desktop application. This is what the application looked like. Uh, it was basically a reimbursement form. So you could re get reimbursement for a bunch of medical expenses, and, or different expenses, and you know, there was a form that you filled out and it totaled the stuff down below, and um, there was also modals for entering information. And they were trying to figure out if they could do this responsive, and the rest of their site was going to be responsive, and, um, I spent a lot of time looking at the interface, trying to figure out how to make this into a responsive design. And at some point, after a couple hours, this is pretty much where I ended up. Had my head down on my desk, could not figure out what I was going to do. 
Um, and I realized that, I, you know, maybe everybody was right that you couldn't do responsive design for applications. Maybe that is, in fact, the correct, um, you know, just the reality of what it is. Responsive design is good for sites, but not good for apps. And I figured that probably wasn't going to fly with the client, so at least I needed to figure out what the mobile version of their app was going to be. So I decided, okay, I'll start with a clean slate, and I'll figure out what the mobile version of this application was going to be. And I said, hey, you know, what, what would this screen look like if I redesigned it just using mobile? Um, and I might do something like this. You know, like, hey, there's the mileage totals, and I wanted to make it much, much more like a form, right? A form on mobile, where it totaled up the information, and, and then you're able to hit submit. And then, you know, if you tapped on, say, mileage, it would show you you know, different information, and then you could tap it, and you could get to the detail page where you could add it or edit it, these sorts of things. And by the time I got these three screens done, I thought, hey, this is, this seems pretty good. This seems to really capture what this application would be like. I should go back and look at the desktop version. Um, I closed my computer. I should go back and look and see if I've covered everything that the desktop application needs. And what I found was that it actually mapped really well to the desktop application, right? Like the total down below ended up being the expense reimbursement form, the tabs actually ended up being the content itself for being able to select which item I wanted to edit. Um, this ended up being a table, but with the actual fields that we care about, and the modals ended up being very similar um, to what they otherwise were. You know, basically, here's the form that you ended up looking at. And once I saw this, I found myself thinking that the mobile version looks so much better than the desktop version. I started wondering if the desktop version could actually benefit from what I had done with the mobile version. And I ended up with something like this. Now this was all rough sketches, and at this point we've actually gone back and done a bunch of work to actually move this to code, and there are things that we've had to change about this process and everything else. But the reality is, is that by starting with the desktop site and just setting it aside for a moment and doing mobile, we ended up with a better InDesign for desktop than we would have if we would have just tried to figure out how to make the desktop side work. So that's mobile first design theory, and that's why it's really great even if you've got an existing desktop site. Those constraints are like hats. Try them on, if they don't fit, who cares? But if they try it on and it helps you find a better design, awesome. Mobile first responsive web design is actually about this idea of progressive enhancement. Basically making our sites bigger, or making, um, starting from the small screen, the basic styles and making them bigger. The way to do this is pretty simple. Um, hello? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. No, that was totally my fault. I just set it down on my finger for a second and hit the button on the bottom of the microphone. <laughs> uh, so the basic way to do this is to take your, your styles and order them from small screen to large screen, right? What you want to do is you want the cascade of your style sheets to actually conform to and be part of that progressive enhancement. And you want to keep your basic styles out of the media queries um, because there are a bunch of devices that don't understand media queries. So the first media query is in fact the absence of support for a media query, right? So your base styles are outside that media query your small screen styles are in the first media query and then you progressively get bigger. That's how you do mobile first responsive design. The moment you do that, IE breaks. <laughs> awesome, right? Like a little of our friend IE. Uh, IE 8 and below. IE 9 supports media queries, everything else uh, does not. So all of a sudden you've got to figure out what you're going to do about IE. And there are a couple different ways to handle it. The easiest solution and probably the most performance solution is to use conditional comments. So you basically take all of your um, layout styles and put them inside a conditional comment that only applies to IE. Um, and then the other option is to use a JavaScript library like respond.js, which will make Internet Explorer before IE9 understand media queries. Um, but we don't use that because we figure that people aren't of IE probably don't have very fast devices, and the way that that media or the way that that library works is by reading through the whole style sheet, looking for media queries, and then implementing those media queries in JavaScript. As you can imagine, that's a little processor intensive. Second thing you've got to do is you've got to keep CSS images in their place. 
The main reason why, or one of the main reasons why these sites are so big, next to the fact that people just give them big images and, and shrink them down, is because people do a lot of hiding of images with display none. And just because you hide an image with display none does not mean that it's not actually still getting downloaded. In fact, most of the time it is still getting downloaded. Um, Tim Cadillac did a bunch of search uh, tests based on um, uh, some research that I had done looking at different techniques on ways that you can make sure that browsers do not download those images that you don't want to download at the sizes you don't want them to download at. There are three techniques that are reliable that have worked um, since 2010. The first one is to have your images scoped inside media queries. So basically we've got background images here and their max width of 600 and then min width of 601. Those two rules do not overlap. Hence, only one of those images will get downloaded. Makes sense. The second one, which is a little funny, is that you can do display none on parent. So if there's a whole section of your HTML document that you're just going to hide, which you probably shouldn't do in the first place, but if you did, images aren't going to download. And then the third one is to override an image with media query. And this works in most places, but it actually causes double downloads for Android 2.x. Um, and unfortunately, Android 2 is still 40%, 45% of the phones out in the world using Android. Thank you, Google. Um, so, you know, that last one is probably not your best option. The third thing you need to do is you need to conditionally load JavaScript based on screen size and capabilities. So the first reason why I ran into problems with responsive design was um, this other development company here in Portland came to us with a site that they built that was really slow on iPhone. They couldn't figure out what was going on. And I started digging in and digging in and basically what I found was that they had Google Maps on the page and they had done display none on Google Maps on small screens. But just because you did display none on that iframe does not mean that that iframe isn't still executing. As a matter of fact, in an example like this, that one iframe will cause 47 files to be downloaded. Huge amount of information being downloaded. So if you've got things that are interaction that are JavaScript based, you need to make sure that you only insert them into the page as the screen gets bigger. You can't just deliver them in the same HTML document to all devices and expect it to work. You're going to end up with a pretty poor performance. There are a few ways around to do this. Um, the first is to do things like media match. Um, there's a polyfill. Media match is actually um, something in JavaScript that you can use in modern browsers that basically executes the exact same thing as a media query, except in JavaScript. So you can see whether that media query would succeed or not succeed. Um, and then there's a polyfill for devices that don't understand media queries. So you can use this exact same technique on IE. Um, Jeremy Keith had written an article recently about this idea of conditional CSS. Um, and it's, it was sort of, there are a few uh, articles, so it's a little, I think, a little harder to follow than a lot of Jeremy's posts. But the idea was, instead of having um, JavaScript replicate the media queries, the values of the media queries, you could actually have the JavaScript watch for changes in the document object model and actually make those changes. Uh, Liza wrote, my co-founder, oh, I skipped. I got these slides out of order. Um, okay, well let's talk about this and then I'll go back to that. Um, uh, the FilmLink group has this really cool example of what they call the Ajax and Clue pattern, which basically says, you know, like on a small screen, you might have something that's just a headline that says news, right? And that's it. Um, but then on a, on a larger screen, that section might actually become the head, header of news and then a bunch of bullet points underneath. So the way that this works is that as, like, once the page ends up larger than 30M, it makes an Ajax call and goes retrieves the bullets to put under that header, right? So it's not in the document by default, but it's basically doing those includes based on the size of the screen. Makes a ton of sense. Okay, so back to what I was talking about with Jeremy Keith. Uh, my co-founder, Liza, wrote this great article about behavioral breakpoints, um, which is, again, this idea of being able to make changes um, 
behavioral changes based on the size of the screen, not simply making layout changes. And then uh, Matt, who uh, worked with us at Cloud4, um, actually wrote uh, this plugin, uh, jQuery plugin, uh, that you can look at and use. And I just wanted to show you real quick. Um, See, and to turn on mirroring. Okay, so um, so essentially, the way that this particular example works is that there is a element in the document called menu trigger, and on white screens, it's display none. And then, add, then we've got, in CSS, we've got a media query that changes it based on the size of the screen. And then this particular element um, becomes display block. And all the JavaScript behavior that powers that is only, only takes effect when that particular element is visible in the DOM versus not visible in the DOM. The reason why this is important is that if we later wanted to change the width at which it switched from being a um, off-canvas menu to being just a block to the side, we just edit it once in the CSS, and the JavaScript takes care of it from there. So that's this idea of being able to you know, do behavioral-based menu queries. All right. Back to the slides. Um, the fourth thing to do is to deliver different images based at different screen sizes. Um, our image tag has served us so well until now. Uh, there's only one source in an image. And what we really want is we want to have different size images at different screen sizes, right? And this becomes a really, really difficult thing to pull off with uh, the image tag. Before we talk about how you might actually handle this, um, I want to talk about these two common use cases for uh, responsive images. The first one is resolution switching. Um, so imagine you have an image of Michelle Obama, and you need to show it at different sizes. You're not making any changes to the image, you're just actually resizing it based on the size of the screen. Um, that's resolution switching. And it also applies for um, retina size displays. The second one is the art direction use case. So say we have a picture of President Obama speaking about the success of the auto uh, bailout. He's speaking at a factory in Detroit. If we have the space, it's really awesome to show the full photo with all the backdrop because the factory backdrop actually tells part of the story. It tells where he was, tells why he was speaking, tells all those sorts of things. But if you take that and you shrink it down, it's nearly impossible to see the president. It's hard to make out who that is. Um, and you guys are looking at it on a large screen. It's like even worse on a computer screen. What would be better is if we actually edited that image, if we cropped it down to him. Maybe we just crop down on his face. Maybe we include the podium. Like We can make that sort of decision, that art direction decision, and we can provide a better image um, and do a better job of telling our story. So that's the art direction use case um, that people commonly talk about. There's a couple other places where art direction makes sense. Um, this is an example from Nokia's browser's website. Um, and what they were doing was they, had, they wanted to show off the browser itself and how awesome the browser was. So they needed to show the browser Chrome. And um, when you know, they started with this wide image, and it showed a ton of the browser. But then as it got smaller, the Chrome ended up too small. You couldn't read or see any of the icons. And so they switched to a vertical orientation, right? So it's not simply cropping. It's actually, it could possibly be an entirely different image uh, based on what you're trying to convey. Another example, uh, Victoria's Secret has, because of their brand, they've got a bunch of um, topography included in their imagery. Um, and it's very, very important for their brand identity to do this. Um, now, we might think, hey, this would be much better if the type was separated from the image. I agree. The chances of them being able to do it anytime soon, slim to none. 
right? So what they end up having to do is as the image gets smaller, they end up having to create different versions of the image or the type won't be readable. So these are three different art direction use cases. I spent a bunch of time a couple of years ago um, looking at all the different ways that people were handling responsive images and basically finding that none of them worked. Um, they all had problems with them. Matt Marquis wrote a good article about sort of the discovery process we were all going through at that point in time and the challenges associated with it. And because of that, there's been a lot of work on creating standards. Um, and those standards are still moving forward, but it is a standards process. So it's going to take a while. If you're interested in this sort of stuff, um, I recommend the responsiveimages.org, the Responsive Images Community Group. That's where all of this work is happening. Lots of discussion going on about there. Even today, for example, there was a big um, conference in New York, the Edge Conference, where they were talking about responsive images and trying to get browsers and designers and implementers all on the same page about how to handle this stuff. In the meantime, there are a bunch of different solutions for this. My personal favorite is the Picture Fill JavaScript library. It emulates the proposed picture element. Um, and you can use it in your site. You just include the JavaScript library and you include the markup. Um, pretty simple. And I'm going to come back to um, image tags in a little bit. The fifth item is to handle high density displays carefully. I was really curious about what it would be like, what the difference in size would be like between a single image that is Retina for like a MacBook Pro Retina versus like what that same image would be like on a BlackBerry. So I took this image from Apple's site, which had um, a Retina version of it, and I started taking a look at what this would be. Now, they had a Retina version of it, and they had a standard version of it, and those were the only two that were, you know, like their own versions. And then the rest of it is me like resaving it in Photoshop and figuring out what the sizes would be. Um, and as you can see, there's a big, big difference in the size of the images between what a BlackBerry, like a BlackBerry curve would see and what um, would be used on a MacBook Pro Retina. Um, if you looked at the JPEG compressed size, so you think, okay, well, that's, that's not that bad, but we've got the compressed size, it's still fairly large. Um, and then, of course, any image that's delivered as a compressed file has to be uncompressed to be displayed, which means that we're back again at 3x. Pretty huge. Or 300x, right? 32. Thank you. 32x. See, that's on them. It's been a long time. Um, Apple.com, what they do is they download the standard images and then they download the high res or the high density images in addition. So you get the benefit of downloading them twice. <laughs> and the page goes from like 500k to 2 megs. Their recent like MacBook Pro um, page, uh, that whole thing, and it's got all this stuff that, um, uh, like, if you go down, it's got a whole parallaxing thing, and as you scroll down and everything, that entire page is something like 12 megs. It's insane. So what do you do for this? In the in the short run, you know, if your content, if if the images that you're dealing with are not um, not necessary for the semantic meaning of the page, it would be really great to put them in CSS because then you can make sure that images don't get downloaded twice. And there's this new proposed specification called um, image set, which is very similar to SRC set for the image tag um, that will allow you to go ahead and um, address this in CSS. Uh, this is just in WebKit at the moment. It's experimental, so don't rely on it. But soon, you won't have to have a bunch of additional media queries just to deliver different size image sources. Um, you can use things like Foresight.js, which is pretty cool because not only does it handle retina images, but it also does this crazy attempt to figure out how fast the network is, um, how much bandwidth is available. Totally nuts. Um, it's like pouring gasoline on your mattress to find out how flammable it is. Um, or you've got the picture fill user preference branch. This is actually my favorite. Because I am not certain, based on you know, how long it takes images to download, I know that people would like really, really crisp images, but I don't know how fast their network connection is. And if I have to choose between somebody opting out of my shopping cart because the images are slow, or presenting them with that really high resolution image, where do I choose? I've talked to a couple of clients who are um, large e-commerce companies, and they are inclined to deliver the standard definition images, even in situations where they know that the images are critical to their sales. 
but they don't want to deliver the high resolution images and have the person's speed impacted because they also know that every millisecond, every second that they delay somebody being able to browse their site is potentially millions of dollars of revenue lost. Um, so they're going to implement something like this where essentially what happens is you can tap on this little area in the lower right hand corner and you can switch between standard definition and high definition and it'll set a cookie as a preference for the rest of the time the person's vi visiting the site. Let them choose. There's also this really neat technique. Um, people have found that if you take really large JPEGs and you save them at lower image qualities and then you shrink them down to save on the page, so maybe they're like twice as big as they need to be, but at 20% JPEG quality or 0% JPEG quality, so they just look like crap if you view them at standard size, but you shrink them down to half size to, because that's the size that they're actually used in the page, that they actually look sharp on retina displays, and, they are, and their file size is smaller than what it would be if you saved it at like JPEG high quality at the, the standard resolution. So you get crisper images and smaller file sizes, right? Like, this sounds amazing. Um, and it seems to work. And yet, I just, it just I, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm just too skeptical and, um, you know, it's like it sounds too good to be true. It's like one of those diets where you can eat whatever you want and still lose weight. I can't believe it yet. Um, a bunch of us on the responsive images um, community group mailing list have been talking about ways to create um, tests to find out how where the barriers are on this. Because I'm fairly certain that at some point, even if you've got a image that's displayed at a small size on the page, it still at some point has to decompress that really large image, right? In order to display it and then shrink it down. So devices that are memory constrained are probably gonna run into problems. We just don't know where that threshold is, like and what sorts of devices will run into problems. So we're currently, like right now, as of the last week, coming up with a series of test pages that we can use and get a bunch of people to test on a bunch of older phones and older devices to try to get, understand where the limitations are on this technique. But keep an eye on it, because this is really exciting. Like The idea of being able to deliver a smaller image, faster download, but actually look better on screens is really awesome. Um, one thing to note is that if we did something like this, I think we'd have to figure out some way to detect when somebody started zooming in so that we could actually start delivering higher quality images because the moment somebody zooms in, the little magic trick that we've done becomes really apparent. It starts looking bad really, really quickly. Um, much, much more so than a standard resolution image that when you zoom in on it, um, it looks pretty good for a certain amount of time. With these images, the moment you zoom in, it just looks like crap. Um, but it's pretty neat. A lot of the, uh, the stuff, the sort of performance-based stuff in libraries, like whether it's Ajax Include or Picture Fill, are all part of a project that the Filament Group did. Uh, the Filament Group is part of the team that worked on the Boston Globe site. Uh, they created this project called South Street, and it contains a lot of these sorts of enhancements. Uh, Scott Gell, who I mentioned earlier, spent a year working um, remotely from portions of Asia where his mobile connection or his data connection was really slow on his desktop computer. And he came back with a bunch of really, really awesome stuff to make things faster. Um, so I, at some point I want to get like another pool together to send him to Asia again um, so that we can get more <laughs> cool stuff. Okay, this problem that we've got with images, um, particularly the image tag, I've been thinking a lot about like, what my ideal solution would look like, um, particularly right now while we don't know what the long-term solution is going to be. And I came up with eight guidelines and one rule. Uh, so these are the things that I would do if, and these are, the, um, these are the things that I advised. I went and talked to a client who had over 800,000 images on their site that have been hand cut and placed over the course of many years. And they want to move to responsive design. Say they decide that they've got three image breakpoints, that's 2.4 million images. Say they want to support standard definition and high definition images, that's 4.8 million images. So it becomes really important with any site of any scale or size with a bunch of images in it to, to start looking at comprehensive solutions for this sort of stuff. 
So the first guideline is to use vector-based images or font icons whenever you can. Um, I, font icons are really great. They're a great way to um, basically replace the things that we used to do with CSS sprites. So you're able to do um, like, you know, hey, this one font contains the 10 icons we use on our site. Um, and Ico Moon has a great facility for being able to create specific fonts for you. Uh, much easier than being able, than like you yourself going in and editing fonts. Unless that's like your thing and then awesome, you should do it. But otherwise I use them, they're, they're really awesome. Um, the Filament Group has, as far as SVG is concerned, the Filament Group has created this, um, this thing called Grunticon, uh, which allows you to take an SVG image and it will output the, um, the, PNG, or the PNGs and sort of the CSS necessary for it. And I totally forgot, I was gonna show you guys. They also now have a web version of this, um, so um, where is it? Ah, here we go. Yeah, SVG ASCII art. So you can just like drop your SVGs onto the Grumpticon uh, little unicorn and put all the files and stuff you need. Pretty neat stuff. Um, sorry, I'm totally self-indulgent to show off the little um, uh, unicorn, but I really, really think that's cool. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, oh, actually, I did want to show you something else. Did you know that you can put media queries inside SVG images? What? <laughs> no? This is craziness. I found this article from uh, Andrea Bovins from uh, Opera talking about this. Um, so the first thing about this that's really cool is that the, the media queries actually apply to the size of the element in the page, not the size of the entire viewport. So here's an image, and as I change the size of the page... You're still in there. Oh, I'm not mirroring. Here we go. Here is... Change. Change. Neat, huh? I'm going to open the image in a new tab. And I'm going to view the source. Hey, that looks really familiar. Media queries inside the SVG. So what can we do with that? Oh, we could put the same SVG image on a page in multiple sizes and just have one download but actually have it look different ways. Or maybe we've got something like this. We've got a logo, and on the left, this is with media queries, and on the right, without media queries. And as the size of the logo changes, well, you'll notice, for example, um, I'm not sure how well this will show up, but there's a little sort of like fingerprint spiral underneath this. Um, at a certain point, the spiral gets really hard to see. Um, why can't I? Hey, it, it's, um, it's totally froze up on me. Awesome. Hmm. One second. Sometimes you have to minimize the browser and then bring it back or something. Uh, it's so weird. All right, let me see if this other one works. Okay, so here's a barcode, um, a bar graph. So I am sliding it, and as it gets smaller, you can see that the, the numbers get too small to read. But on the right, on the left, we're actually changing them, the labels, at several points. And then maybe when it gets too small, we change to a spark line. Versus the one on the right, which you can't do anything with. Okay, I'm, I'm Okay, I guess I can hop down this slider, which is sort of strange. Um, so here's a spot where you can see that the swirl in the background has gone away, and the line has gotten thicker. Again, the line has gotten thicker. At this point, like, 
the outer line is too thin over here to really get a sense of what's going on. Like it doesn't carry the same weight that it did at larger sizes. But over here it's still working. And then once we get small enough, oops, now it's a favicon. Right? So we can actually embed the rules that we have about an image, like the logo, into the media queries, which is pretty crazy cool. Um, I have no idea why the slider's not working on that one. Um, that's what I get for demoing it in Safari instead of Chrome, which is usually where I demo it. Okay, so, neat stuff. The second thing, encourage people to upload as high an image as possible. Like, have the system set up so that people can upload the highest resolution they've, image they've got in the CMS. You know, and storage is cheap. Uh, we don't know what size images or what size devices will be out there in the future. If we've got the largest size image in our system, we can then use it for whatever comes down the road. If we don't, then you're in the position like the company that I was consulting with where they've got 800,000 images and they have to go find the source files. Imagine that task. Uh, number three. Um, provide automatic image resizing services. Right? Like nobody wants to go like this whole idea that we're going to go like resize images all over the place just doesn't make sense anymore. Right? Like we, it probably never made sense for at some point bef before 800,000 images it didn't make sense for them to be hand resizing images. But definitely at this new world, like we need the systems to be able to do this for us. This is what computers are good at. Um, and we're going to have to probably deal with sometimes where they don't optimize things quite as well like from a design perspective, but doing it manually just doesn't make sense. Um, we want to present, we want to create a system that's flexible. So something like Sencha, which has this service called source.sencha.io, where you can specify like, hey, this is the width, 320, and here's my source image. Give me, the, give me an image resized to 320 pixels wide. I don't define the height, I don't have to do that calculation, it just does it automatically for me. And because it contains a size in the URL, this is really, really nice for proxy servers and caching and this sort of stuff. Every image has a unique URL of whatever size it's needed. We don't have to, ahead of time, know what sizes we need. We just have to tell it in the URL what we want. Uh, most of the time, you wouldn't actually have this sort of thing where you have the HTTP in the URL as well. You'd probably just have your own service doing this. Um, Adam Bradley, the guy who created Foresight.js, had this great quote, he's like, save for the web should be a thing of the past. I think it's absolutely true. Like, we're moving to a point where it no longer makes sense for us to do save for the web out of Photoshop. Like, we can't, that is not a sustainable model. Um, and he built, uh, if, you're, if you're a small site and you're looking for these sorts of services, Adam built um, a CDN that is really inexpensive that provides a lot of these image tools. Um, if you're a large site and you're using Akamai, they've got a front-end front -end optimization service that does a lot of these image resizing services for you. So there's stuff at the low end and stuff at the high end. Uh, Adam's service is pretty cool because you can upload actually an Illustrator file and it'll output PNGs, SVGs, uh, whatever you need out of that Illustrator file directly. I'm pretty crazy. Uh, the fifth one, provide automated output of whatever your solution is, picture fill or whatever the alternative is. Um, and for the client we were working with, we ended up looking at something like this in the templates. We decided that we were going to only put in sort of the breakpoint information into the templates. And then we were going to have a centralized function that would output picture fill markup or whatever markup we wanted to use for images. Um, this way, we wouldn't have across you know, this huge site in all these different templates all of the picture fill markup. Because we know that at some point that's gonna to have to be replaced. By centralizing it, we know that we can just go to one place and update it, and it'll work for all the images down the line. The sixth one is to provide some way, if we're doing all that automated, we need to provide some way um, in situations where we need to do art direction. For this client, we had a handful of templates. We knew which ones they were. Um, there's like 5% of the images out of that 800,000 where the art direction use case applied. And for those particular images, we made modifications, or they are making modifications, not me. Um, it's, their, unfortunately, it's fortunately their problem, not mine. Uh, but, but the solution we came up with was that they would make modifications to their content management system to 
basically allow somebody to enter the breakpoints and the image sources for that particular issue. issue. If you're going to centralize all this stuff, you might as well make sure that you've got the best practices for image compression built into the system, right? Like, what's the benefit of having a centralized system if you don't do best practices? So there's a bunch of things that you can do to optimize images, and you should do them, right? You've got all the images centralized, perfect opportunity to, to get on the best, best practices um, bandwagon for images. And the eighth one is sort of a bonus. WebP is a new image format that is much smaller than JPEG and PNG. And if you centralize all this stuff, you could also detect if the browser supports WebP and optionally give it the WebP image. So those are the eight guidelines. You know, when I worked with that client, I think we ended up being able to do five of them, and the other three we decided either weren't important or they just didn't work. Uh, they weren't possible. Like, we were using Akamai system. Akamai doesn't support WebP. We're like, we get so much benefit from Akamai, we're not going to trade all the, you know, other benefits for being able to support WebP. The one rule, plan for the fact that whatever you do now is going to be deprecated. This is undeniable, right? Because whatever solution you implement at this moment is absolutely going to be replaced by standards. Okay, so it's two years later. Let's revisit this original question. Like, can a one-size-fits-all solution compete with a tailored experience? Or will it always just end up being too big? I think it's fair to say that it's unlikely that responsive design will ever be as fast as something that's custom tailored. Um, I, I don't think that this is a controversial statement, right? If we build something that's only intended to ever be viewed on an iPhone 4 at 320 by 480, and that's it, we're not even worried about new phone sizes or anything like that, we're going to be able to really, really tailor that experience to that device. All of the unique characteristics of that device in terms of its network, Connect connections and all of those pieces. So it's probably going to be true that if we're building something that works across the continuum of devices, we're never going to be able to build something that's as fast as something for one specific device. But we started by talking about the fact that web is a balancing act, right? And that performance is just one of these factors. And because of that, I think that for most projects, responsive design can be fast enough to make a ton of sense. Um, it can be performant enough so long as we actually take the time to do it right, to build mobile-first responsive designs. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so Matt, uh, Matt is going to run around with questions, or a microphone for questions. For questions. It absolutely is the case. So, uh, generally in website design, there's a bunch of stuff that's um, uh, starting with sort of the Yahoo performance, exceptional performance team, uh, when they created the Yahoo 14 best practices for site performance, and then continuing when Steve Souders left and went to Google. There's been a bunch of research on what makes websites load fast. One, like, there are four that I think are actually the most important out of all of those. Um, one of them is minimizing or reducing the number of HTTP requests. Um, it's always been the case that the number of, the browser only has so many requests that it can run concurrently, so the number of assets that you try to download is limited. It's sort of like you've got a big, um, like you've got a big pipe coming into your house, but what happens from the browser's perspective is because it can only load so many requests at the same time, it's sort of like somebody at the other end is like opening the pipe and then turning it off, opening it on and turning it off. So being able to reduce the number of requests actually makes the page load faster. So that's true regardless of device. On mobile, it's even more important because of latency in the network and basically every HTTP request being even slower than it is. Um, it is something that I consider to be across the board an issue, whether it's a responsive design or not a responsive design. Um, and so it's not something that I include in the talk uh, because of that. 
and because, frankly, it's just like too much crap to cover as it is. Um, but yeah, it is absolutely a case. The other three, just as long as I'm at it, the three that I think are the most important is a gzip, which is so incredibly stupid and simple. For most web servers, all you do is turn on gzip, and it will gzip all your text files, like your CSS, your JavaScript, your HTML, just takes care of it magically. Like in Apache, it's three lines. And yet you would be surprised at the number of websites that don't have it turned on. It's stupid. Um, so 80% savings from three lines of code, and there's no performance hit. Everything's faster. Like, I don't know why more, more people don't do it. Third one is um, uh, far future expires headers. So basically, if you know an image isn't going to change, or an asset isn't going to change, or you're going to actually do the work to change file names as those assets change, tell the browser that that file will, will change, won't change for 20 years. And the browser will keep it in its cache longer. And it won't request, it won't even do the, the sort of conditional request. Because um, browsers will do this thing like, if this file has changed by this date, then request a new version of it. And even that request to the server to ask if the file has changed takes up an HTTP request, which would be better used downloading something that's actually changed. And the last one is making sure that images are sized correctly, which we've spent a ton of time talking about. Other questions? Video and audio, so the question is about video and audio. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about video first. There are three issues with video um, in responsive designs. There are the, the first one is um, simply are you going to get the correct codec for the particular device? Um, and this isn't a responsive design specific thing, but this is just a general issue. HTML5 does a really good job, um, particularly the video element of having different source codecs and fallbacks. Um, perfect, so long as you code it correctly and do your testing. Shouldn't be a problem. Second one is, particularly when you're working with video that's embedded from a third party provider, how do you make sure that it retains its aspect ratio as the page resizes? Because if it's embedded via an iframe, it has no idea what size it is in the page, and you have no idea what size that thing inside the iframe is. Um, and so you see solutions like fitvid.js that attempt to recalculate the size of the iframe as it goes along, as the page is resizing, to make sure that it actually maintains its aspect ratio. So you have to do something like that from a JavaScript perspective. Um, there's another service called Embed Responsibly, which does that as well. The third issue is actually the one that you don't hear people talking about as much, which is I've got something, I've got somebody viewing a video on a small screen device. How do I make sure that they're not downloading the HD video? Right? Like, how do I actually make sure, in the same way in which we're talking about different sources for images, how do we make sure that we're not giving them video that's so huge that it's slow on their device and they can never see it? Um, and video is one of the cases where bandwidth is actually a, a heavy price that companies pay. So it becomes really important to do this sort of stuff. Um, in that scenario, there is, there's a couple of things. In the short run, our saving grace is that video doesn't download automatically. So we can do JavaScript detection and do things via JavaScript. And a lot of the services that allow you to embed video have already been doing this sort of stuff. So if it's Akamai's um, video streaming services or Brightco's streaming services, they already like change the size of the video based on what the player, like the size that it is in the page. So that takes care of it. The second thing is, once it's streaming, you've got, um, from an Apple device perspective, you've got MPEG streaming, or no, um, HTTP live streaming, which is a, a definition which will allow you to adjust bit rates. And then the other providers, like the really video-focused providers, have been doing similar stuff, but without standards. MPEG is actually changing. MPEG 4 is going to start, or, I believe it's MPEG-4, is going to start supporting something similar to live streaming. It's called MPEG-Dash, which will solve this sort of problem. All of this is to say that just like we don't do save to the web anymore, I think the video has successfully been taken out of the realm... Man, this microphone keeps cutting in and out. Taken out of the realm of something that we do as individuals. Right? Like, this is the sort of thing where you're probably going to want a service to handle it for you. Like, not something you do. 
Audio, um, I know just a little bit about, um, not nearly as much. Uh, we had a case where, um, this is something just to check and test on. Uh, iOS used to always download MP MP3 files in web pages, even if they weren't actually played. They download the full pay file, uh, which is horrible. Uh, so if that's the case, if it's still doing it, then you probably want to just like not have the actual source in the page until, um, or like remove it from the page or something until actually the person hits play. But on the audio side, I don't know as much. It's not a problem from a layout perspective, obviously. Other questions? Give the example of Apple site as something not new because they download the standard definition before they download the high definition. And, you know, my understanding of the rationale behind that is get something up there viewable right away. It may take longer to get the high definition down. Uh, what's wrong with that? Uh, I think the, um, the real danger is that you've got somebody who's accessing that over a data connection that's metered. Right, like, I mean, I think that there's a responsibility that we have to people who have metered data connections. Um, and that sort of behavior is not necessary in order for somebody to see what they need to see, and you're actually, you know, downloading an excessive amount of data unnecessarily. Um, I, I understand the rationale for it. I mean, I, I guess it would be better than waiting, maybe? I don't know, it's, it's a tough question. Retina, retina images, for me, I'm, I'm firmly of the point where if we can't get compressive images to work where we feel like that's a good solution and it works um, well enough and reliably enough that we can, we can use that as a solution, um, I want to wait for things like SRC set to be implemented, um, which, by the way, is in as a prefixed attribute in, I think, in WebKit and Chrome, or it's in WebKit and on its way to Chrome. Um, and then basically allow people the option of opting into retina images. I just think that there's so much damage that we can do both from a performance perspective and from sort of like an end user's pocket perspective by making bad decisions there. Um, Apple wants to sell those devices, right? And wants to show off the retina display. It's like, I totally get their perspective on it. It's also the CO2 footprint perspective, uh, which is kind of, kind of important. But I'm curious uh, whether you've looked at skeuomorphic cards. Are you aware of the concept at all? What do you think about that kind of approach? Basically, the, the concept is that a form redesigns itself based on interaction with the user. You start out in a way. A form does? Yes. I haven't okay. seen that, no. Okay. Um, what I've been looking at more lately is, um, which might be similar to what you're talking about, I'm not certain, but it's the idea that I think that we're moving towards designing a system of interrelated components, um, and those components end up having to be um, responsive in themselves. And um, I think that uh, that it's, it's actually a, a, a limitation right now of the way that we do responsive design, that responsive design is based on the viewport as opposed to the size of the element in the page. Um, and so I've been looking at a lot of the, the stuff that's related to you know, element queries and, and some of the thinking there, and all the problems associated with it. But I, I, I feel like in the long run, if five years from now we're continuing to sort of have this hack of viewport on like elements within the page, that's problematic. And I, whenever I hear things like forms, my, my instant thought is like I would want to make the decision about the form um, sort of independent of whatever else was going on in the layout. Like the form itself has intrinsic characteristics that would define how it would be responsive. Um, probably not exactly what you're talking about. Uh, you should send me a link. I'd like to look at that. Else? Oh, awesome. Well, thank you guys very much. Thank you. So I just want to mention, um, if you're working on anything interesting, I, I used to say this every month and I haven't for a while, 
Uh, if you're working on anything interesting or thinking about something really cool, um, we'd really like to hear about it. Um, we'd like to put together, further in advance, uh, uh, talks um, and develop them a little bit more. So, um, and, and especially if you're working on something that we haven't really talked about, um, especially I, I'm kind of interested in anybody who's working on hardware right now. Um, I think it would be really cool to hear from you. So just get in touch with one of us, we'll put it in our you know, queue of stuff and try to develop it. Because uh, we'd really be interested in hearing from some of you up here. And Matt, you said we've got two people lined up for next month, right? Um, at least two, at least two, yeah. Um, so we're good for right now, but I want to get out there. Yes. So next month, come back next month. <laughs> anyway, so thank you, Jason, and we'll see you the fourth Monday of October.